Welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show, where we hold candid conversations with fascinating individuals from all walks of life, where we learn about their passions, their successes, their failures, their lessons learned, and how they've applied personal growth to their lives. We end every conversation with key takeaways that we can all implement to better ourselves and the lives of those around us. As always, I'm joined by my co-host and my good buddy, Greg. Greg, what's happening tonight? Man, Sammy, I'll tell you what's happening. I've got a glass of whiskey, and I'm excited about the conversation that we're about to have with our special guest, who I'm going to introduce now. So for the Pursuit of Growth world, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Rob Arnold. He is the former master distiller of TX Whiskey Distillery. He is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, and a third-generation member of the whiskey industry. He was first in, the first employee of TX, at TX Whiskey starting in 2011, and he's overseen the creation and innovation of TH Whiskey and TX Bourbon, as well as the research and development of the distillery's limited expressions and yet to be released products. He is also a writer. He is the co-author of Shots of Knowledge, The Science of Whiskey, and his second book, The Terror of Whiskey, A Distiller's Journey into the Flavor of Place was released in 2020. Dr. Rob Arnold lives in Dallas, Texas with his wife and his two-year-old son. Rob, welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Should we cheers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Start it off. Yeah. Here's some good conversation about some good whiskey. Cheers. Well, we'll start out, hey, right there. Let's just jump into mm -hmm. it. Rob, can you explain to our audience what is the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Yeah, this is, we get, we get this question all the time, or I used to when I was giving tours at TX Whiskey, um, what is bourbon versus whiskey? So bourbon is just a style of whiskey. Uh, it's very similar, it's analogous to the, the comment that Merlot is just a style of wine um, or that Burgundy is just a style of wine. So bourbon is a style of whiskey, um, has to be made in the United States. So there is a regional regulation to what to where bourbon can be made. And then also, also follow a set of other rules. The easiest way to think uh, it, the ABCs of bourbon is a kind of something that has been coined in the industry. It's a good way to remember the, the, the big rules around what is bourbon. A is American made. Uh, B is the barrel that has to be used. You have to use a new charred oak barrel when you're making bourbon. And then C is the corn content. You have to use a majority of corn in the recipe to produce bourbon. But in the end, it's just it's, all it is, is a style of whiskey. And whiskey is just a fermented beverage made from grain that's been distilled and almost always aged in an oak barrel. There are very, very few exceptions where you can forego maturation in a barrel to make whiskey. Yeah, and, and I'm not surprised to hear you say that that was a very common question that you got when you were giving tours. I can't tell you how many times from college until today, <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhere and the conversation about whiskey comes up and the difference between bourbon and whiskey and this yeah. and that. And then there, there's, and I, I don't know the legitimacy of what I'm about to say, but I've heard people say, oh, well, whiskey has to be made in Tennessee. Well, I'm kind of like, is that uh, true? Yeah. Because there's whiskey made in Texas, correct? So hey, what type of rumors do you hear about whiskey and kind of the ins and outs of, of, of how it's categorized? Yeah, I mean, so that comment probably stems from Jack Daniels, which is Tennessee whiskey. Um, and that, that's a, also a regulated style of whiskey. It's really more of a subset of bourbon. Um, but there are, to make Tennessee whiskey, you have to add an additional step known as charcoal mellowing uh, before the barrel maturation process. But the, the point is, like, you're right. Like, I've, I've heard all sorts of stuff like, well, I don't like bourbon, but I like whiskey. Or I don't like scotch, but I like whiskey. It's just like saying I don't like Merlot, but I love wine. You know, it doesn't. So that's just, but that's not the consumer's fault. That's the industry's fault for not doing a good enough job with education. But whiskey is the most general, uh, it's the most general way to categorize this type of alcohol. And it's all it is, like I said, is a, it's, a, it's basically beer that's been distilled into a spirit that's put into an oak barrel. So whiskey is distilled beer, just like brandy um, is distilled wine. 
Um, mm. And then within whiskey, you have a lot of different types of whiskeys. You have Scotch whiskey, you have Irish whiskey, you have Canadian whiskey, you have American whiskey. And then within each of those regional distinctions, you have classifications based on other things that are followed as far as the ingredients and the techniques. So within Scotch whiskey, you have single malt Scotch whiskey, which has to be made from all malted barley and distilled in pot stills. Within American whiskey, you have bourbon whiskey. Um, which has to be made from majority of corn, Asian, new charred oak, and made in America. Um, so there's, and that's just in, in Ireland, you have a, a style not as well known, but it's, it's called pot still whiskey, which is a bad name because it's just like single malt. It's also made in pot stills, but that's what mm -hmm. we call it. Um, the distinction between pot still whiskey and malt whiskey is that pot still whiskey also contains unmalted barley along with malted barley mm -hmm. and has to be made in Ireland. Point is, we have lots of different styles, just like within wine, you have countless styles based on grape variety, where, they're, where the grapes are grown, um, techniques that are used, you know, all of that creates uh, thousands of, really thousands of iterations of wine and whiskey has lots of iterations as well. But in the end, it's basically just distilled beer put into an oak barrel. That's all it is. That's fascinating. I, one of the things we're going to definitely get to your book because I, I've, I've been fascinated by it and I was so excited to talk to you about it because it's it hits on my like I, I'm a nerd. And so it hits on like my nerdiness, Me like too. the charts and the tables and the everything. And I, I've been listening to yeah. it. So like as I'm going through all the different flavor profiles, I'm just like, wow, I was like, this is so cool. And like, I wish I had the books. I'm going to actually buy the copy of the books. I can look. Yeah, at you tables. need to buy it. You're so you're listening to it. Yeah, they uh it, no, no nothing against the audiobook publisher because i was very happy to see it but i wish they wouldn't have read the tables out like you can't you can't follow a table when it's being read out to you so yeah if you, if you have the audiobook uh it's great but you probably might want might well here i'm gonna plug it twice you buy the audiobook and the hard copy so hey, you actually you see all the tables i have in there yeah it, those chapters with the tables are hard to follow without seeing the tables. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like I mentioned, we're going to get to that for sure. But one of the things that we always love is, I mean, Greg and I, we're, we're the exact same way on this. We love origin stories. Like we just want to know like who we're talking to. The audience loves who we're talking to. They want to know a little bit about you and that kind of stuff. So I think really one of the first questions that came to mind when we were talking about your origin story was we really want to know a little bit more about your family's history in the world of whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Kentucky and Louisville or Louisville or Louisville or whatever. So what's the proper pronunciation in your mind? Uh, I, okay, so if you're from Louisville, I, well, I just told you. you just go, <laughs> if you're from there, you usually say Louisville, although I've got friends that live there that say Louisville. Um, but usually you slur it as bad as possible to where it, someone that's not from there is, can't understand what the hell you just said. But um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in Louisville, um, and yeah, I'm third generation member of the industry. So my my uncle and my great uncles and my grandfather were, were all in the bourbon industry. Most of them were with Brown Foreman, which is a, a mm -hmm. big company that owns Woodford Reserve and Jack Daniels and Old Forester and, and brand, lots of brands outside of bourbon as well. Um, but they're based in Louisville, and uh, I met my uncle. Um, was a he ran an engineering company that built distilleries. So I uh, had engineers in the family. Had uh, my you know marketing and brand ambassadors that uh, that was you know. But I was the first distiller actually of the in the family. Um, but I had a lot of help from family friends that were distillers, um, and that was definitely a big a big help to me in the beginning was the resources I had through my, my family and, and friends of my family to teach me the craft and, and give me the ins and outs. And like, actually the, um, like I, I, so I was getting, this is back in like 2009, 2010. I just graduated from Tennessee, from, you know, from Tennessee, um, with a bachelor's degree in microbiology. And I, I went, I came down to Texas to do a PhD in biochemistry at Texas at the, at the at UT's medical center in Dallas. And, um, I, but I started making beer in grad school and then started understanding that whiskey is just distilled beer. And then maybe started making whiskey in grad school at home. Oh, you'll never know, but, um, <laughs> cause it's illegal, but you know, right. <laughs> maybe, I maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but, um, either way I decided to leave 
that that grad school with a master's degree early because it was a PhD program. I left early to to join the whiskey industry. But when I when I first started talking to my family and and uh, got connected with some uh, just the family friends that really were in the industry from the from the production side as well and told them that I wanted to be a master distiller one day <laughs> their first thing that I ever really the first meeting I ever had that, that was around me joining the industry was uh, and I told someone that was well we kind of made that title up you know there's not really there's no such thing as a master distiller it's all it's marketing but each distillery kind of has its own definition of what that means but you don't, it's not like a master sommelier. There's no certification. There's no governing mm. body. Um, some master distillers are probably what people would think they are, where they're actually out there running the stills or running the production plant and involved with how you combine barrels to create a batch. And some are almost purely on the marketing side. So it just depends. But anyways, well, I, uh, I'd be interested yeah. to, to, to hear a little bit more about what was it like to go from, I mean, leaving school to become a master distiller? What was the driving point that made you say, hey, this is something that, that I can do and that I want to do? Well, it started off, I really wanted to start my own distillery. And so I was a grad student. I was 23 years old, didn't know anything about anything, but I definitely didn't know about starting a distillery. I had this wild idea that I would just on the side, start a very small distillery and stay in grad school. Um, and so I was talking to some developers in the area, actually in Fort Worth, um, about wanting to build a distillery and actually RAR Brewing Company in Fort Worth. So I got to know Fritz and Aaron RAR who run, who, who um, were the, you know, the founders of RAR and they had, you know, verbally said, well, we'll, we'll sell you some of our beer to make whiskey because um, again, whiskey is just distilled beer and yeah. actually some great brands have started by essentially buying beer from breweries next door and distilling that. Uh, so that way you can like, you don't have to have all the equipment up front. You just need to still, yeah. hmm. but, um, through talking to developers in Fort Worth, um, and I was looking at areas over there by raw and South side Fort Worth. They, the developer was like, well, you know, there's these guys down the street doing it. They're going to do this too. Uh, their name, it's Troy Robertson, and Leonard Firestone. And, um, so I found Leonard Firestone's Gmail account online. And I emailed him and I said, uh, hey, I, I don't know anything about raising money, but I, I'm a scientist and I know how to make whiskey. And uh, if you give me advice on how to raise money, I'll give you advice on how to make whiskey. Not knowing at all if he already had a distiller or knew all about it. I had no idea. Uh, but he ended up calling me and, uh, and then we, we got along and I went and met with him and Troy at the distillery and they needed a distiller still. And so it just seemed like an opportunity I, I couldn't pass up. and. Um, you know, the thing about whiskey making and wine making and brewing, and there, there's a, there's just, there's so much science that goes into it. So I wasn't leaving my science, you know, mm -hmm. passion behind, but there's also so much creativity and, you know, it gets labeled as art sometimes. I don't know if that's the best word for it, but there's a creative approach. There's, there's a craft to it. And I really liked that as well. There was a, you had to at some point leave the science behind and just pursue the craft. And then I had the family ties and it just, it just all kind of came together. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to leave medical research. Um, to, I always joke. I'm like, well, I just, I decided to leave behind a career in, you know, medical drugs and go make a recreational one basically. <laughs> but I never left the drug discovery world. I was just doing a different kind of drug discovery, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it actually, for me, it was pretty seamless and it was, and you know, my family wasn't surprised necessarily. I mean, the, biggest surprise to my family was why aren't you going back to Kentucky like why are you going to make bourbon in mm. Texas you can't make yeah. bourbon in Texas um but besides that it was you know it actually wasn't a it wasn't much and most people would probably think that if you were telling your parents you're going to drop out of school to to go make whiskey it would be a shocker but for me it would it wasn't that uh it wasn't that case really so what was your response whenever they did say that like why aren't you coming back to kentucky like why why texas uh well i mean to be honest my family and this isn't that uncommon for a lot of kentuckians up until maybe the past five or ten years but they didn't think you could make bourbon outside of kentucky mm. um you know bourbon uh, Con congress 
it, well, it, was, it really it wasn't up until the 1960s that we even put some rules around where bourbon had to be made. Um, matter of fact, during Prohibition, there was bourbon made in Mexico. So you can, you know, <laughs> I don't know of how many bottles exist, but there are probably still some bottles floating around of the label bourbon on a, with, you know, a Mexican distillery. Um, wow. But we put some rules around it, said, okay, it has to be made in the United States and other countries recognize that as well. But um, Kentucky just, it, and this has nothing to do with, there's part of it has to do with the ingredients and the environment that we can, that you have in Kentucky. But for the most part, the reason Kentucky became known as the, the home of bourbon is much more just coincidence and um, just the way history kind of played out and where the distilleries after prohibition congregated and where conglomerates were and where, and, um, so the Kentucky became known as, you know, the home of bourbon. And it is the, it is in a lot of ways, it is the, the home of bourbon. It's hard to sit here and say it's not, but you can make bourbon anywhere. Um, right. and so I think it's been the, the home, but it, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, a lot of other states in the country that really put their mark and i think eventually begin it's going to take some time but eventually begin to compete with kentucky in terms of recognition quality volume all mm. those things now it's going to take us it's going to take a long time it, you know not not five years it's going to take decades but it's similar to what napa had to do when they were trying to prove themselves against Fr you know france i mean it, we we take it for granted but napa used to be not a well-known place for wine it was known mm. as you know this is just something out in california where they're making some wine but it's not any good it does nothing compared to what we're doing here in france so it takes time to develop that kind of recognition um consistency and volume volume's massive i mean the amount of whiskey being produced in kentucky compared to anywhere else including texas is i mean there's a there's just not even close so it just takes time to build the, the infrastructure and, and the expertise but it will happen and i think texas is primed along with a few other states primed to really make a run at, at, and Tennessee primed to make a run at Tennessee and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Tennessee doesn't have nearly as many distilleries, but they have, um, you know, Jack Daniels is a, it, it takes the cake, you know, it's massive. So, um, you know, there, there's a, there's definitely a, but it wasn't until recently that a lot of Kentuckians even knew you could make bourbon outside of Kentucky. So mm -hmm. that was their, that was their kind of issue with the fact that, I was going to do it in Texas was, you can't do it in Texas. You don't have the right water. You don't, you, know, you can't do it down there. What are you talking about? Well, speaking uh, of doing whiskey and bourbon in Texas, you did it. And yeah. uh, you did, you did it, you did it very successfully. I'd love for you to share um, along the journey, in, you know, picking up on the story where you talked about where you met the, uh, you know, the Farson yeah. and Robertson guys. Um, what were some of the biggest setbacks in terms of the journey and then share some of the successes that you have yeah. because uh they're 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 pretty substantial well i'm i mean the first thing we did uh so when my first day on the job was the first day of uh construction on the on the first distillery building so we had we built our first distillery right outside downtown fort worth on uh on vickery boulevard so if you if you know where like the justin boot outlet is or the dickies outlet is in mm -hmm. fort worth which you can see from the highway we were just down the street from there um and the initial phase of any distillery is a lot of fun once you get into that part of it. I mean, you've, you've, I came in after fundraising, which was, you know, for me in a lot of ways, that was pretty fun. I had all the money. We had, we had, <laughs> I didn't have to do any of that work. That's a very, that's obviously a very stressful and hard part of the process of building any kind of company, including a distillery, probably more so than a lot of companies because you're trying to convince your investors that not only are you going to put a lot of their money into a product, um, it's, you know, it's not the most seasoned type of, uh, investment that you know you, it's, it's kind of new but you're also not going to sell anything for a couple of years you know you're going to make whiskey and then put it into a barrel and not see a return <laughs> for many years but um you know the first part of your company it's a lot of fun you're building it you're installing the equipment you know these big shiny copper pot stills or column stills or whatever they are coming in and you've got you know especially if you haven't really done this before like you're jumping on forklifts and you're mm. you know you're moving water through the system and then you're all of a sudden you're milling grain. And I went, I went to Missouri to pick up our, our roller mill and, you know, just all these fun adventures to, and then, and then you, then you install it and then startup and startup is incredibly stressful and difficult because I don't care how hard you try. I don't care how good your engineering team has been. I don't care 
if you've done this for 50 years, a startup is always, it's tough because you just, you have to work through the kinks of the system. Um, and, and that takes time. So, you know, the, but the beginning years are, are, it's, it's fun and it's, and it's high, you know, it's, it's fast paced and there's nothing really more rewarding than like actually tasting whiskey that you've created from, uh, you know, kernels of corn and wheat for the first time. I mean, not, I'm not saying the age stuff. I mean, the stuff coming right off the still, you know, it's like alchemy happening, you know? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's, that's a lot of fun, but then there, I will be honest, like once you get into it and once you have your, your procedures in place as a distiller, I mean, it's all about, it's all about routine. It's all, um, is there innovation? Do you try to create new products? Of course, but no distillery is ever going to be successful if you don't have some higher volume, consistent products. And so the bulk of your time is focused on making the same thing the same way every single day. Um, so that can, that, that's, to me, that wasn't the most fun part of the job. Now you can find passion and I did in trying to create, uh, you know, achieve consistency. That's incredibly difficult to do. Um, uh, and then you're also trying to sell it, which is not easy either. You know, TX, we had, we kind of like, uh, you know, it's like lightning in a bottle. I mean, and we don't really know what, I'll be honest, we don't really know what exactly happened. It was just whether it was the, the TX label, the leather boot caps, mm -hmm. the, the package in general, the flavor of the whiskey. I mean, in reality, it was, everything had to come together to work the way it did, but I mean, it took off in a way that we could never have expected. The distributor never expected it. Um, and growth was just, I mean, I mean, hell, it was like linear. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know. Well, honestly, just... honestly, when you tasted it for the first time, the, 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 the product that you were going to go to market with, did you yeah. taste it and go, man, we've got something here? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, no, I mean, you, you, I don't think anybody does because I think the more you do this, the more you realize that you, you can't, drink your own Kool-Aid or, or believe yeah. your, your own gut. And I mean, all of us are well aware of what, especially as you get experience, you're well aware of what types of, of taint compounds and taint flavors are, can be present. Um, but it, it's still hard. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of flavors out there. And it's hard sometimes for us, to, if it's our own product, to to sit there and say okay is this like really great or am i just drinking my own kool-aid mm -hmm. and for me I, I learned early on to um that you never want to get you know you you do everything you can for consistency and quality and you choose the best ingredients you can and you push every envelope to achieve the best flavor but um in the end you you can't just you need to get it in front of people and let them taste it early on and let, let their reactions drive you and not be biased towards your, what you think is something really great. Cause so, um, so, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in. So I want to, I want to piggyback on something Rob just said in, in terms of ingredients for the person that doesn't understand a lot about what's in whiskey. What do you think are maybe kind of the handful of like the ingredients you just got to get right to make sure you've got a good quality whiskey? You got to get them. Yeah. So it's the ingredients of whiskey are the grains, including the malted grains, um, the yeast and the oak barrel and malted grain is just grain. that has been partially germinated and dried down, but those are your three ingredients. So water is very important. Water is mm -hmm. not going to contribute flavor in most cases. Sometimes it does, but, um, you can pretty much create good water anywhere these days with filtration, but right. it's, you have to go out and find high quality grains. You need to have a, a clean way to propagate your yeast and also know how to choose the correct yeast strain. And um, you have to have the right oak barrel. Um, on top of that, you can't mess up anything in the process, whether it's the milling, the mashing, the fermentation, the distillation. If you do anything incorrectly there um, or cut corners there, you can essentially cast away any of the amazing flavors that are coming from your quality ingredients. Or you can manipulate something in a way where you've created bad ones inadvertently. So like I... I don't mean it to be like an answer of like, well, everything matters, but it really does. And yeah. I've seen this happen over and over, but the way I explain it, it's not even the way it's, this came from a different book, this analogy. Um, and it's the way that, uh, that 
Dr. Jim Crow, who was a, he was, he's been gone for a long time, but he was one of the first distillers to um, kind of bring some real science to the craft of making bourbon. But the flavor of whiskey is like a tapestry. You pull any thread, whether it's an ingredient or a process, and you're going to shift something. And that is so true. So, you know, if you, if you, if you cut corners anywhere, or if you, if you haven't honed the craft when it comes to the process side of things, you, you can very quickly create bad whiskey. It's, it's incredible. And it's, it's, it was very frustrating early on for me. Um, how delicate whiskey is. Like, I think people probably just think, well, you just throw it in an oak barrel or, it, and it just turns out good. Right. Like, yeah, right. It's simple, it is, right? yeah. Um, and I mean, we thought that, I mean, that's what I thought it was just can't be that hard. Um, and it, but it's just, it's, a, it's crazy how like the barrel will not fix a bad distillate coming off the still. Mm. Um, and you can put really good distillate into the barrel and make bad whiskey or let it age too long and any or age in the wrong environment. I mean, any of those things can really influence it. So it's just like wine or beer or any kind of other spirit um, where you've got so much going on with, you know, you're dealing with microbiology, you're dealing with chemical engineering, you're dealing with the natural environment during maturation, you're dealing with barrel chemistry, you're dealing with grain chemistry. It's just a very delicate process and you really have to you have to hone it from the science side and you have to hone it through experience on the craft side. That's what I was about to say is like, just from a scientific approach, I'm sure that like looking at all those variables um, and, and understanding like what, right. Tugging on one can totally skew everything else that you're doing. Yeah. You, you know, you mentioned like you can have a, a, a bad whiskey in your, in your mind, what, what constitutes a bad whiskey? Like what are some of the, I guess mm -hmm. maybe at a high level, what makes a bad whiskey? The, there are, I mean, this is getting into the chemistry side of things a little bit, but there are just, there's a handful of taint compounds that uh, if they're present, they can essentially ruin a whiskey. And it doesn't mean that the, the whiskey, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be great. It doesn't mean the distiller is a bad distiller, but if you have, you could have a great whiskey in every way at the chemical level, but if it's high in something like geosmin, which is what beets smell like when you cut them up, mm. that will probably ruin your whiskey. Um, if it's super high in certain volatile phenols um, that might be produced through excessive cooking and the, and the mashing stage or something, it's excessive heat in the mashing stage, that can ruin your whiskey. Um, there is one called TCA, which is cork taint that's in wine, right? Um, that can also enter into the whiskey making process, usually through the grains. Um, so it doesn't always just come from cork. <laughs> you forget it. You, that's going to ruin it. It doesn't, it won't, these things will not age out. They're not going to go away. They're, they're going to be there after four years, after eight years. And um, so that to me, a bad whiskey isn't necessarily, uh, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of ways you could potentially mingle barrels together in a way that isn't the most harmonious of ways where you end up with something that isn't super balanced, but that, that to me isn't a bad whiskey necessarily. It's just a whiskey that maybe didn't achieve its full capacity. It's full, it's, but where you have bad whiskey is when you have some of these things that just ruin the experience for the drinker. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't drink it. I mean, and I've dealt with some of these tank compounds and, like, you know, give me, they give me nightmares. So like I, but I can't drink a whiskey that's high in TCA or geosmin or, or, um, certain, you know, acid out of high, super high levels of that come off like nail polish. I and mean, I just, I mean, it, it, there's nothing fun to me about drinking those. They're, they're so that that's a bad whiskey. Mm. Great answer. For the record, I've made some of those. So I'm not trying to say, it's, <laughs> you know, so I've had plenty of bad batches that came off high in some of those compounds. Well, wow. well, well, Rob, you also made a book, and so yeah. you're, you're you're an author, which is super cool. Um, what was the inspiration to write your most recent book? Yeah, the Terroir of Whiskey was something that um, it really started way before I even knew what the word terroir was or, or thought much about it. But I, um, you know, when we first got into the to the, when, we, when we first started TX Whiskey and we wanted to make a straight bourbon and we knew we wanted to do that from scratch and we wanted to use Texas grains. And so we went out and find a grain, found a grain broker very, very close to the distillery 
in Fort Worth that could provide us with Texas grown corn and wheat to make a wheated bourbon. Um, so TX bourbon is primarily corn with a complement of soft red winter wheat and then malted barley. Well, uh, I asked the broker, you know, where, where is this corn and wheat coming from? And basically it's kind of like, well, it's somewhere in Texas. It could be anywhere. It's, it's dozens of farms. It's, it's maybe more than that. And, um, and then if, when I inquired, when I was asking, well, what kind of varieties are we working with? You know, cause there's lots of different varieties of yellow corn, just like there's lots of different varieties of red grapes, you know, Merlot is a variety of a red grape. So is Cabernet, you know, so what kind of varieties of corn are we working with? And it's kind of the same deal. It's like, well, dozens, who knows, maybe more than that. You know, we don't, we don't get that specific in the commodity grain system. Mm. We're just going to sell you yellow dent corn from that's, a mix of farms all around Texas. Well, that's kind of like a winemaker being told, well, you're going to make wine from these red grapes and it could be any variety. It could be from any vineyard. We don't really know. And that's obviously not how the wine trade works. Um, in general, it's not how wine is made. Um, so uh, when I first I basically became aware of how the commodity grain system worked and began, began to learn more about how the wine making process worked, realized there was a massive dichotomy between the way winemakers pursued grape selection and whiskey makers pursued grain selection. So uh, I basically talked to the grain broker and we were really friendly. I just said, look, I'd like to have a farmer directly supply us these grains. So at least I know where they're coming from. And maybe I can even, you know, maybe we can even narrow down the varieties that are grown for us. And I didn't really know much about what that would mean for flavor. It just seemed like the right thing to do. You know, I'd like to have more insight into where these, this grain is coming from. Um, and they hooked me up with John Sawyer, who is a fourth generation Texas farmer in Hillsboro who runs a 4,000 acre farm. And he was all about this. He was all about whiskey making. Um, he loved the idea of partnering up and supplying us with grains. And he became our sole grain supplier. And we became very passionate about farm projects. Uh, you know, he was instrumental in bringing rye and barley to Texas and growing it successfully to make whiskey or beer. But I mean, through all of that, and, and again, like we, we both, actually, he also had some background in the wine trade. Um, and we, we both realized like, what terroir is to a winemaker is essentially the interplay of of how grape varieties interact with the vineyard environment. And, you know, that, like, why is a Merlot from, you know, Sonoma different than one from Napa Valley? Mm. Um, it's not just the environment, it's the way those varieties are interacting differently through their environments. And um, it just basically brings back to this point that understanding the variety of grain you're working with and where it's grown can be really instrumental in the flavor that develops in the whiskey and it, anecdotally i realized that because john was growing these varieties for us and it was all coming from his farm and i could tell a distinct difference in the flavor in the new make that was holding true through maturation hmm. compared to the grain that came from the commodity grain broker but in the whiskey industry this whole idea that grain mattered in that way was hotly debated um the idea that terroir could impact whiskey was hotly debated still is and again terroir is just the interplay of the the variety of grain and, and where it's grown it's mm -hmm. it's nature and nurture that's all it is it's the interplay of nature and nurture um just like we all have dna we all are we have a genetic blueprint and we're in the way that's red and the traits that we have are impacted by the environment it's the same thing with grains or grapes or anything else they have a genetic blueprint based on the variety in the context of grain and grapes and where they're grown impacts the traits they express, including flavor. But it's just, it's been highly debated in the industry for a long time. And I thought anecdotally, I realized that it was important. Um, decided to see if anybody at Texas A&M would let me do a PhD studying this. And luckily I did find somebody, uh, Seth Murray. <laughs> yeah. Seth Murray's a corn geneticist and, uh, um, plant breeder at Texas A&M and he had an interest in whiskey and so he took me on as a PhD student I was able to do that part-time maintaining my, my full-time job at TX 
And so my research is all around whiskey terroir and understanding how different varieties of corn and where they're grown impact the flavor of whiskey. And so we established some scientific framework around why it is important for the flavor of whiskey. And, and then through that, I just, you know, I basically thought, well, maybe there was a book here and started pitching it to different publishers. And uh, for some reason, Columbia University Press thought it was a good idea. And, and they, they signed me to a contract. And then I got to go travel around the, you know, the country and the globe, uh, visiting distilleries that were also actively pursuing terroir and their whiskey. So I got, to go, I got to go visit some great distilleries in New York that were creating a style of rye called Empire Rye using local grains. Got to go to Kentucky where there's a lot of this going on, even among the big players like, um, like Woodford Reserve and Buffalo Trace. Got to go to Ireland to visit Waterford Distillery, which is one of the most terroir-centric distilleries that's, that exists, or ever has existed. Got to go to Brooklady on Isla in Scotland. That was amazing. So, um, but it was, you know, with all that, all these visits and all these different distilleries, I, I, you know, got to go hang out with, and um, we're still, a, we're still, we're still kind of, it's becoming more mainstream and accepted, but we're still a bit of the outsiders that think this really matters that much. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's something that's really prevalent in the book, and and I I think I'm on. I'm on the chapter. I just finished the part about actually this morning on my run. I uh, listened to the part about the Empire Rye. Yeah, yeah. Was fascinating. Yeah. Just to, and and so much so I know exactly where I was on my run whenever I uh, stopped it. And it was the part about how you went over to a uh, um, a local place in New York and had a Brooklyn uh, Brooklyn IPA I think it was or Brooklyn yeah. beer in honor yeah. of the guy that uh, yeah because I visited with the New York distilling company founder yeah. who was originally who was the founder of Brooklyn Brewery back in the day yeah yeah so, so the, uh I I mean I think um, you know this this idea that the where the grains grown and what kind of varieties we work with um, why I think it's especially important for newer distilleries that are trying to make a name for themselves and a great way to do that. And we did this really well with TX, even though it wasn't necessarily through terroir, but we found a way to capture, uh, you know, and basically win our own backyard. You know, you have to be able to win and, you know, and, and make sure that your own community actually buys into what you're doing and, and working with local ingredients is a great way to do that. And that's being, you know, like I said, it's more and more becoming a thing and, even though we're just scratching the surface on why it ma how much it can matter for flavor, um, it's still in, in my in my opinion it's something that is worth pursuing for a lot of us because it it ties us back to the land where we're actually making the whiskey and, and to our communities and to our farms. You know, <laughs> we've had the separation of the farm and the distillery since prohibition, and you know, um, we're reconnecting those two industries and paying your farmers fairly for a quality product because a lot of times they make less on an acre of their harvest on the commodity market than they actually put into it. The only reason they stay in business is government subsidies. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I think there's a lot of reasons outside of just flavor why this, this is important. You know, the, the book does a really good story. Sorry, Greg, I'll, I'll yeah. make this comment and I'll let you ask a question, but the book does a really good story of blending like that storytelling and the science. And so you do a great job of like, sending people on the adventure with you and I like the, this yeah it's fascinating I, I really like i've been talking i nonstop. i've been talking to greg about it um since i started reading it and I, I mentioned to you i think on on instagram that it went anthony bourdain's book i finished that then i went to uh dave yeah. Roll's book and i finished <laughs> yeah. that and then i went to your book and i'm i'm just throwing this out there i'm not blowing <laughs> smoke like it's been an, an incredible journey to hear the storytelling aspects and and it's right up there on par with it because you really do give people that sense of connection to what you're doing from a scientific approach. I love the fact that you kind of set everything up. It's like, okay, I've told you the science. Now let's tell you the story. And I, I yeah. really appreciated that because I was like, okay, now I see what he's trying to do. And yeah. uh, it, it, it's really like woven that thread. One of the cool things I thought was, well, good. yeah, yeah so, well, it really perked my ears up was because I'm from South Texas. And uh, you went to the Texas AgriLife Extension in Calhoun County. Well, yeah. I was born eight minutes from the Texas yeah. AgriLife and I grew up in Calhoun County. So 
I was like, well, hell, that's like right in my, literally my backyard. So uh, yeah. I was pretty fascinated by that, which I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you thought about good old Port Lavaca, if you ever had a chance to go down there and visit. Well, I'll be honest. I, <laughs> I didn't actually go down there and visit. I worked with the extension specialist down there to get the You didn't samples. miss much, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was a fun project where that was the first part of my PhD dissertation was uh, we took the same varieties of corn and grew them on four farms throughout Texas and then harvested them separately, distilled them separately, and did a lot of really sophisticated chemical and sensory analysis. Um, I didn't do that. I actually had a, a great master's student at the time that did all that work. And then when she graduated, she became TX's. Um, she went through lots, she's head of quality control, then flavor chemistry and whiskey science. Now she's the master blender, Ali Ochoa. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that was actually kind of the start of us establishing some, some chemical and an actual analytical sensory data around how terroir can impact the flavor of whiskey. Well, Rob, this is probably, I'm going to, I'm not a scientist, so the analogy I'm about to share is probably way off base, but I'll follow it with a question. But I remember years ago talking to somebody that uh, was just going on and on about how great New York pizza was and shared a story that somebody started a New York pizza joint here in Texas, had all the same ingredients, the same, everything, did everything exactly like it's done in New York, but it doesn't taste the same. And their point was, it didn't come from New York. So like in my, mm -hmm. like Neanderthal brain, I'm like, terroir just sounds like it makes sense, right? So my question is to you, now that you've written this book, have you received feedback from folks that are on the opposite side of this conversation? Have you managed to, to change any opinions or, or have, you, have you maybe qu gotten them to question a little bit more? Like what's the impact of your book been so far? Um, I like to believe that maybe some of the people on the, you know, the terroir uh, naysayers have at least come around some or at least think that maybe there's a, I do think that what, it's not just my book, but I think, um, and, and this is still incredibly niche within the industry, even yeah. much less the general public, but I will say that I think more and more people have come around on the idea that, okay, it, it can potentially impact flavor, but we don't think it can impact it that much. It's kind of like the new, it's kind of like, at first it was, there's no way it matters. Now it's more of, okay, it might matter, but it can't matter. It doesn't matter that much. So it's not worth worrying about. Yeah. So, um, but I do think I've, I actually have talked to a couple of um, whiskey writers. There's a couple of whiskey writers um, or whiskey people, whiskey uh, industry professionals who have made um, that have been very against this idea that have made lots of comments or talks or whatever um, published articles, how this is ridiculous. And, and I've talked to them. We've actually got along great. And I think where we all kind of come to the same place and this is really where my passion for this lies. While I think that the pursuit of terroir and whiskey is great for the, the diversity of flavor, and I do think it's great for connecting distilleries back to the farm. Um, and I think that's great for, you know, the local ingredients. I think, uh, again, it's something that's really powerful, especially for new brands. Um, and I don't want to downplay the flavor. I think that we're going to discover more and more old chemistry that we've lost through modern plant breeding and industrial agriculture flavors that we didn't know even we could get from our grains because it's been over hundred years since we've, uh, since anyone's tasted something like that. And I think there's some new chemistry that we haven't discovered yet that will create amazing flavors. But I think where this really comes to me, where I'm, why I still care about this a lot in a lot of ways has to do more with the idea that terroir, that, this idea, this romantic notion can really allow us to achieve a more sustainable form of agriculture for our raw ingredient. And I think that's maybe the most important part of this is that sustainability on the farm, you know, someone needs to pay the farmer more money to grow right. in a more expensive fashion that is more sustainable, whether it's organic or not to convince the higher ups at these big companies, these big distilleries, that's worth paying more for our raw ingredient because it's more sustainable. It's going to have to come in my opinion, with some sort of marketing appeal with some sort of reason why it's going to sell more cases. And if you can tie, if you can really elevate this idea of terroir being important and having a connection to the farm and growing grains in a way where you're 
trying to achieve good flavor and you really can't achieve good flavor and grain without doing it in an ecological way, then I think that all of a sudden we can achieve sustainability, even have regenerative agriculture come into the industry more and more. And you're, and you're making, and you're still making a, a, you know, there's a return on that. And I think that we have to have both of those. So that's really where, and that's where me and even the people that have been very against this idea kind of come to the same place and agree is that, okay, well, if we can use terroir as a way to explore what is possible with flavor, that's great. But more importantly, if it's a way for us to really achieve sustainability of the raw ingredient, well, no one has any issue with that. That's a, that's a pretty interesting intersection of like, mm -hmm. because you think about it from a, well, to one thing you said that I just, I can't let bypass, but flavors that people haven't tasted like in a hundred years, that's just fascinating yeah. to me that, that yeah, it's like unfathomable. Modern plant breeding and animal breeding. Um, and we've only shown this in a few crops, but kind of like anecdotally with what I could experience, what I experienced when we switched to Sawyer Farms and the flavor of our new mix distillate. Anecdotally, people have noticed over the years, like, well, you know, chickens don't taste as good as they used to. And, um, you know, modern tomatoes, the big red ones don't have that much flavor and they used to have more flavor. And, you know, yellow dent corn isn't very good, but they used to have like this really good blue corn. And uh, like, Modern plant breeding has been focused on essentially one goal um, since around prohibition, coincidentally, and that goal is, is yield, is how many acres can you grow on, how many bushels can you grow on an acre, or how fast can you make that chicken grow before you can, you know, turn it into chicken breast, chicken thighs to grill, and that, this pursuit of yield, we have inadvertently um kind of either diluted or bred flavor away from our from our um ingredients and from our uh from our you know whether it's animals or or plants we've we've bred flavor away and they've they've shown this in tomatoes and a few other crops like we've like modern breeding pursuits it's not any we're not trying to breed away flavor it just happens through this natural part of evolution called genetic drift but we have we essentially like have turned off a lot of the genes that are responsible for the production of, of flavor compounds um, at least in tomatoes and and there's you know you might not think a tomato and a corn kernel look very much alike and they don't they don't taste alike but they are both the fruits of their respective plants and actually share a lot of genetic and, and chemical similarities so you know there's I, I do think that we're going to discover a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of flavor um, in some of these older varieties that we haven't used in a long time, but more importantly, how we can bring these really interesting flavor traits from older varieties into our modern, better producing ones. That's, that's a, a really interesting angle that's being pursued right now too. You see so much in like just the food industry, the craft beer industry, everyone talking about the ingredients right uh, coffee as well right single origin beans and and all that as well it's fast it seems like the time is right right to to have you have the mass produced stuff which is fine right but then you've got like these smaller niche markets or these niche companies that are producing things that are yeah maybe they're smaller yield overall yeah. but quality is through the roof right you yep. you Think about that. Just like with coffee, I, I buy, I, I love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I mean, it's, it is what it is, right? Mass produced. And thanks yeah. to one of our former guests, um, uh, Jason Simmons, Jason Simmons. He, he turned me back onto it for a long time, but I also buy the specialty bags that, you know, get little tiny little bits of, and they're amazing as well. So I think everything has its own kind of, um, yeah, I agree. Fit right completely in the industry. Yeah. Completely agree. Speaking of flavor, and quality. Rob, what are a few of your favorite whiskeys? Um, yeah, I, I've gotten this a lot. I don't have good answers because I don't, I don't have one. Um, I mean, I was very proud of what we produced at TX, especially uh -huh. what we produced in the past couple of years. It hasn't even been released yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be some amazing whiskeys coming out of, out of the TX distillery over the next couple of years. And the people that lead the distillery now from the production and, and um, blending side or the, dis the distillers and the blenders are 
uh, Ali Ochoa is the master blender. Evan Brewer is the new master distiller. They're fully capable um, in a lot of ways, more so than me, to, to really lead these new expression, the creation of these new expressions. So very proud of what we did at TX. Um, I, being from Kentucky, I mean, bourbon is probably my favorite style of whiskey, although I'll, without a doubt, I just did this last week. I'll, you know, go buy a bottle of peated Isla single malt and that's all I'll drink, you know, for a couple of days. So like, I kind of, I kind of shift around and, um, but I, if I had to pick a style, it would be Kentucky bourbon. Like, you know, if I had to have one whiskey for the rest of my life, it would be bourbon whiskey from, um, you know, from Kentucky or, or the stuff coming out of TX here soon. Maybe, maybe I'd pick one of those too. I don't know, but, um, the brands in Kentucky that I like a lot, um, I've always been a big fan of, of, you know, the stuff you can find on the shelf anywhere. I like Maker's Mark a lot. I like Buffer Reserve a lot. Um, I love the stuff out of Buffalo Trace, yeah. whether it's just Buffalo Trace or, you know, their antique collection is, I don't get, I don't get to taste a lot of that very often, but it's very good. You know, the, the, the Stag and the E.H. Taylor. I actually, I'm a massive fan of, is that what you have? That's hey, a, I'm, stag right now, yeah. He's got oh, wow. stag, and I'm drinking yeah. E.H. Taylor small batch, bottled in bond. So I'm drinking. Uh, I'm a big fan. I like Jefferson's bourbon a yeah. lot, and the fam, mm-hmm. the family, the, the Zollers are good people, and um, the, the family that uh, started Jefferson's. Um, the uh, I I really like the small batch stuff out of Jim Beam. I mean, Booker's is one of my favorite whiskeys, and I, I like. Uh, basil hayden and bakers and knob yeah. creek i mean i i think jim beam has this real and i feel this way about willet too they have these amazing and wild turkey uh very distinctive house flavors that i just you can't taste anywhere else and that's a testament to the fact like we talked about every every part of this process does matter because those house flavors are not coming from uh almost surely are not coming from the grain or the yeast or the the barrel solely it's the combination all of that and plus whatever they're doing in the distillery whatever kind of whatever you know microbial buildup is in the pipes and um whatever processes they use whatever it is it's just you know the house style is a real thing and um so i just rattled off like 10 15 different brands i guess but um i i i'll be honest like the because i I know how hard it is to make good whiskey, even just a good four-year-old whiskey that's that's middle of the fairway. I know how hard that is. It's hard for me to like really try to put certain styles or certain brands on a pedestal over the others. Cause I just, I know like the fact that Jim Beam white label can be that good and that consistent and that volume is like, it's crazy. And so yeah, there's, they all like, they all, you know, like you were saying everyone, everything has its place, whether it's Dunkin' Donuts coffee or, or craft coffee. I mean, I kind of feel the same way about everything from the, you know, the baseline expression from a distillery all the way up to their most coveted. I mean, they all kind of, they're, if, if they're doing things right, they're all, they all are well-made whiskeys. So Rob, what do you think when you're out somewhere and you see somebody get like a whiskey and Coke? Go for it. Hey, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I can enjoy whiskey and Coke. There's a funny quote from, uh, I think it was from Booker No, who was the, like very the larger than life master distiller for Jim Beam but I think someone at one point asked him like if you or maybe it was from his son Fred no but if you know if you have what if you take like one of Jim Beam's best bourbons and mix it with coke isn't that like you know a travesty and he said no that means you have the best bourbon and coke in the world you know <laughs> no, the best not. bourbon in the world you mix it with coke you have the best bourbon and coke in the world so i told i told sammy before uh before we got on um with, with this conversation that years ago my go-to drink was the whiskey and coke yeah and i was watching tv and it was a guy named myron mixon he's a barbecue celebrity chef he was on one of those like barbecue pitmaster shows yeah. And he made a comment on one of the episodes. He said, I've never understood why somebody would ruin a good glass of whiskey with Coca-Cola. And so that like resonated with me. So I started drinking whiskey neat from that yeah, point on. Yeah. I got to be honest, Rob, I prefer the quote you just said. <laughs> and well, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I may have to reverse course a little bit now. Well, I mean, just so you all know, like, you know, Pappy, Pappy Van Winkle used to drink his bourbon with, you know, a twist of lime and some ice and, Elmer T. Lee, the poor master stiller at Buffalo Trace. I think he was really into ginger ale and his bourbon. Um, 
there a bit, and what I'm getting at is like all the master distillers, especially from the old the old guard, uh, they all for the most part were mixed yeah. in there. <laughs> they at least they would they had no problem doing it. Let me put it that way. I, I love it. Um, is is there a whiskey drink that you like that that like you, you go out to a bar? I mean, you mentioned whiskey and coke or whatever, but like I love whiskey sours. Like there's yeah, something about that, sure. you know. If it's made with egg white, and then like, I, I love yes. I love whiskey sour that yep. way. Um, I I do I and more and more recently I really do like the the traditional cocktail that I think I Manhattan's and whiskey sours and I do like old fashioned. It's kind of sweet, but I, I do like it. Mm -hmm. um, and I like um, you know it seems like a lot of these these bartenders, mixologists, whatever whatever title they want to go by um because some don't like being called mixologists now but uh, right. or never did maybe but uh some of the stuff they create is just so fun to drink so um i've tried my hand at making you know manhattans and whiskey sours and old fashions and um it's you know you gotta learn how to do that too it's it's not the easiest thing to make a good cocktail but no i'm i um kind of like the way i'll shift around with the style of whiskey whether it's bourbon or a peated isla scotch or uh, a rye whiskey like I'll, I'll, I'll shift around too if if i'm kind of in a i'm going to drink whiskey neat for the next couple of days or i'm going to mix it up with cocktails i kind of i kind of move around there too it's just i don't know it's too fun there's too much out there to just kind of keep it one way the whole time there's just all these yeah. different styles and flavors and um different ways to, to drink uh the drink whiskey so Love it. Well, Rob, this is the part of the show where we start to begin to wind things down and, and wrap things up. And so we have a couple of questions that we ask every single guest that comes on the show. And then without a doubt, my favorite part of the episode is when Sammy and I will share our key takeaways that we got from this conversation. And like I say on every show, it never fails. I've got a full page of notes um, <laughs> that I've got to figure out what I'm going to actually select for my three. Um, so it's going to be a challenge. Um, but, you know, you, you shared your origin story, you've shared your success and your drive and your passion um, through your life. I'm curious to know, do you have, um, I guess, it, probably a way to set this up and be what first comes to your mind when I ask you, what's an actual tip or habit or a best practice in terms of your personal professional growth you feel has been something that's helped you to excel and succeed on this path that you've been on since you left school and made a commitment to uh, to make whiskey a yeah. big part of your life? Um, so much of um, what I'm proud of as far as my career has, has happened because I, I wasn't afraid to either email or call or go bother somebody with an idea or a question or a, a pitch or something that no one was telling me I needed to do that necessarily. Um, it wasn't going to make a difference in my paycheck potentially that year, but everything that, you know, whether it was meeting Troy Leonard in the first place uh, through a random Gmail, you know, find and, and emailing them or, um, you know, getting the book writing, which happened uh, through friendships at TCE with Eric Simonic, a professor there who we co-authored our first book to, you know, sending out pitches to publishers and, um, you know, going back to do a PhD to, to study whiskey terroir. I mean, these are just things that um, they happen because I, I, I didn't care if someone said no. And I just figured the worst they can do is ignore my email or ignore my phone call. And that happened a lot. <laughs> I can tell you, it took me years to find someone that would let me do a PhD. I got a ton of no's. Um, so that was, that's definitely been something that's uh, made, made my, it's, I've only been in the professional, you know, I've only been working for 10 years, but that that uh, that kind of mindset has helped uh, has helped me do a lot of things that have been interesting and rewarding. There's there's another question that that we ask all of our guests, but I would be very remiss if I did not ask this question before that. But kind of what's next up on the docket for you? Like what where where are you going? Where are you headed? Yeah. Um, so I left TX back on October eighth. Absolutely no bad blood between me and TX Whiskey or Pernoa Card, the company that bought TX Whiskey a couple of years ago. Um, it was just time for me to move on. Um, I've been there for 10 years, which, you know, it's kind of crazy for someone. <laughs> I guess I'm a millennial. It's, you know, millennials don't usually stick around jobs very long. So 10 years felt like a really good run. And 
Um, I, there are things on the horizon. Um, I, you know, I'm right now in the middle of a non-compete phase. It's not much longer, but because of that, I'm uh, kind of laying low, getting some stuff together, getting things lined up without reaching that non-compete because uh, I'm not going to poke the bear at Pernod Ricard. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I'm not leaving the whiskey industry um, and I'm not leaving the, um, you know, my, my science background behind either. So it's just uh, here in a couple of months, I'll be able to uh, kind of divulge more of what I have going on. But um, it's, I, I will tell you this, I, I'm not going to start in a new distillery and uh, I'm, not going, I'm not going to be a, an active day-to-day -day master distiller um, in, in this next phase of my career. Um, but um, my goal is to stay very involved in the production innovation and kind of where the style is going to go um, as well as really be a part of, of other distilleries journeys and helping kind of bring their dreams and visions to life and, and play and play a role in that. So. Yeah. That's awesome. That, that's great to hear. Uh, I think the stuff that you produced in, in the, the knowledge just from, I'm, I'm a huge fan. And so like from the book, the information, the way that you present it, I think the the world of bourbon and whiskey and and all around is going to be a, a better place with you out there uh, helping each other out. So I can't wait. I, I would say that I'd hold you to a commitment of of one of these days to come back one day and and unfold and unravel that onion for us so we know exactly what yeah. all you're into. Yeah. I'll be happy. I'd be more than happy to. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe we could do it in person too and get you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sample. That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the other questions that we, we have to wrap the show up, we always mention this, and you've heard this old phrase is, if you could go back in time 10 years, what advice would you give yourself? Well, we've taken that question and we've flipped it on its head. Imagine this, we are writing, we are creating a, the pursuit of growth time capsule. So you're going to write a note to yourself right now, and you're going to stick it in there. And in 10 years, we're going to go dig it up. What would that note say? Well, what I'd be saying to my, to myself 10 years down the road base. Um, yep. Well, man, that is kind of tough, isn't it? You kind of throw it around a little bit. <laughs> um, I guess I would, um, I mean, I hope that in 10 years I would, I, have, I wouldn't have lost that that drive to, to, you know, to not be afraid to, to go out and, and make connections and ask and ask some of those questions that have led to some of the funding I've gotten to do in my career. So I guess I would want to tell myself in 10 years that I hope you didn't stop doing that because <laughs> that's mm. not really advice, but I hope I don't lose that in the next 10 years. Um, but I, you know, one thing in the industry, maybe this is a good way to look at, like one thing that is tough for me in the industry is that I, I left medical research behind to do this. And sometimes I, you know, I have this feeling of, okay, well, does this really matter that much? Cause it's just whiskey. And whiskey's just kind of, you know, it's fun, but it's that, that I leave something behind. And I hope that I can, I hope that in 10 years, I would tell myself to, to maybe remember that there's a lot of reasons why this is uh, you know, yeah. an important, an important craft and why it's important to continue the legacy and, and be a part of, of elevating the style. And it takes lots of people to, to create something like whiskey um, and wine and beer and all these things. And that someone that some of us have to, you know, have that passion to continue to, to push the style forward. So yeah, That's, maybe something like that. Yeah. I, awesome. I appreciate, I appreciate and, and, uh, and love that perspective because i think you're dead on and uh man sammy here we go this is this is the tough part for you and i so again rob we've said this a couple of times now but sammy and i are going to share three things that we took away from this conversation historically i've always cheated and i usually do like five or six but i've made a commitment <laughs> to sammy that i'm going to narrow it down to three because that's the uh that, that's the, the the genesis of why we wanted to be able to put this in this part of the show um, so Sammy, I'll let you lead off. You want to go first and then we'll bounce back and forth? Sure, I'll go first. And so one of the things I think is a common thread that we've, we've discussed here is that the consistency uh, was something that you were always striving for and that you almost found a passion or you did find a passion um, 
within that striving for that consistency and that quality. And I think that's something mm-hmm. like a, a big picture thing in life too, is something as we talk about, like at the pursuit of growth is that finding, you know, utilizing a roadmap in which you can then have consistency and quality, but giving passion to it as well. I just think that's something that yeah. we were very similar on. Well, Sammy, that was my, uh, my top one. So, uh, <laughs> so w- w- way to take it right off the, uh, the docket. Um, I- I'm going to go back to something that you shared just, uh, just recently, but I loved when you said, I don't care if someone says no. Hmm. And I, I believe that one of the biggest challenges our society faces is fear of what other people think. Mm-hmm. And all too often I talk to people and I put myself in this category too, where often I am held back from things that I want to do, or I feel like I have an opportunity to go for a risk because of fear of what someone else is going to think. And when we overcome that fear, it's amazing where life takes us. And quite honestly, and it's just like you said, you got told no a lot. Well, guess what? No doesn't kill you. And you can yeah. keep moving forward. You can keep growing. So I love that. I don't care if someone tells me no. Yeah. All right, Greg, my second one was, I really like the analogy of, and this was in the book as well, about the tapestry, about pulling the thread. And I think that's a great analogy for just life in general. So the the fact that you can pull on one thread and you can impact like kind of the, the entirety of the tapestry is something that we kind of talk about what inside the pursuit of growth, because there's 11 different areas in which we feel like you should be pursuing growth in. Um, and we've talked about this from time to time. Greg uses this great analogy. If you have like your life in order, but you have one area that's like this glowing red ember, it's like, Hey, there's an issue here, whether it be whatever, you know, your family time or your hobbies and experiences, like that's going to skew everything else. And I think that was just a great life lesson that you shared there that it's not just in life, but it's when everything that we do, um, was pretty impactful. Again, Sammy, you took my second star. Um, <laughs> I think this is the first time that you've actually taken my first two um, back to back, but uh, I've got plenty more. Man, I loved your story about how when we were talking about how did you get started in this whole thing? You said, man, I just went and found an email, Googled it, and shot an email to the guys at Firestone Robertson, and you just introduced yourself. You took initiative. And again, it goes back to that I don't care if someone tells me no. But again, just in the theme of what you've talked about through this whole conversation, there's just a passion for the initiative that you take. Mm -hmm. And again, I hope people listening to this episode realize you can apply that to any aspect of your life and things are more likely than not going to go well for you. Yeah. And just to, so y'all know, and just, I, I mentioned how I got a lot of no's on, you know, book pitches and PhDs and all that, but I also got a lot of no's on trying to be a distiller too. It wasn't like FNR was the first one I reached out to TX whiskey. It wasn't the first one I reached out to. I got, I mean, I applied to Balcones. I, I applied to a handful of ones here in Texas and I've applied being, you know, reached out like, Hey, I want to, I want to do this. I want to work with you guys. And I, I you know, uh, ones, people in Kentucky, Tennessee, and, you know, radio silence on most of that. So, yeah. you know, it just, it wasn't that it, the, even just getting becoming a distiller it had, it had a lot of no's or or no answers, you know. Yeah. Well, the persistence paid off for sure. That's that's awesome. That's another takeaway. That's not my third one, but that's another <laughs> great takeaway. Um, I'm actually going between two uh, because I'm wondering if I want to hit it. Like, I'm wondering if I can guess which one Greg's going to say and go three for three here. <laughs> um, or if I want to go with one of my, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to save that one. I'm going to see if I'm right, hold me to this. But the one that I want to talk about is you mentioned something when I brought up the comment about the hundred years since we've tasted that particular like food or whatever it is. But you said that most people now are seeking the pursuit of yield. And I think that's very relevant in the times that we live today and what we talk about in a book. Again, I'll relate it back to the book, but so much so that instead of like, people shouldn't just be talking about the pursuit of yield or what they can achieve and what they can attain and what they can gather. Um, but you talked about it, like equating it to the pursuit of growth, like the, the quality, the, the entirety of the aspects of it, like people should almost skew towards this understanding and developing a 
pursuit of growth versus just like what all stuff we can take in right right so um, just this hit me with a nice chord there well sammy that, that was fantastic but you didn't go three for three <laughs> Um, here's here's my real number three i've got you right well, here and, and I, I may be going a little bit off on a, on a limb here on this one but like just even before we had this conversation and quite honestly before i was introduced to your book rob i'd never heard the word terroir before and so it was kind of fun for me to understand kind of where it came from and its origins and why and really how it applies to to whiskey but i started thinking on a much deeper level how it applies to all of our lives and it's all the ingredients. It's everything that we feed ourselves, both mentally, physically, you name it. And uh, I just, I've just really appreciated this conversation. I've really appreciated hearing you talk about what you do. And it just got me thinking again, just man, in everything that we do, it's the ingredients that we're putting into it. It's the environment mm -hmm. that it comes from. It's the environment that we choose to put our place into. It's who we surround ourselves with. And that's all about the pursuit of growth, which is, you know, same in my passion and just how that applies to our life. And then part two of that answer, the just skews completely different. I just wanna say TX whiskey is awesome. And man, that's <laughs> one of my favorite drinks. Um, I drink it all the time. And my older brother, it's probably his favorite whiskey. And that's so Ted, awesome, yeah. if you're listening, man, I'm giving you a shout out <laughs> and, uh, and sharing with Rob, um, you know, how much you love TX whiskey. It's a, it's a big player in the Brinkley household. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, um, like I said, I. Even though I'm not there anymore, I'm so proud of the team there. And I'll, I'm going to, we got all these, you know, expressions that are only available at the distillery. They release them every couple of months. Like I'm going to be the first person online picking those up. So, yeah. and it's funny, you know, you haven't gotten into the book far enough and I want to bring it up, and, but um, you know, the pursuit of growth it, where I come to in the book, I'm, I guess this is kind of like giving it away a bit, but I, I, I come to this realization that it's the pursuit of terroir that's that's truly the important part of this whole process and I, I use that phrase towards the end a lot and that's that's what I'm getting at there has to do with the the, the human element that's involved and, and what the farmers and this, the distillers yeah. are doing what, to pursue terroir and why it matters and again it yeah. goes beyond flavor and um but yeah I think that that's what you said it resonates a lot I mean you um you know if you don't pursue whatever you know your dreams your growth your whatever it is if you, if you don't make those efforts they're just you know it's not going to happen if you don't pursue terroir you're not going to capture it in your whiskeys and that was that was kind of the point that i came to but it, it applies all over the place so well Rob, i gotta take, I gotta take another where, note where, where can people where can people buy the book where can people learn more about you this is your opportunity to kind of share how our audience can uh can, can get engaged and yeah. can follow you on your path yeah i well i'm so the book is available uh, you know on amazon of course and it's through the publisher is columbia university press so any kind of local bookstore can definitely get uh, a book from columbia university if, if they don't have it already if you want to support your local bookstore um but yeah i mean you know, in the book, uh, you really will learn more about whiskey than just the terroir. So you'll learn about whiskey in general. I'll go through, you know, everything from how it's made to the chemistry of it to, um, and then really dig into the raw ingredients and how they play a role. Um, I'm not super active on social media. I do my best. I'm um, dr.robarnold on Instagram, I think is now what it is. I actually changed it recently, dr.robarnold. Um, if you want to follow me there and I think it's the same thing on Twitter, but I, I probably need to improve my, it's my social media game. I'm not, I'm not the most active on it, but um, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of posts every, every couple of weeks. Maybe they're worth looking at. Nice. Well, you can find more about Sam and I at our website, live tpg.com or the pursuit of growth.com. You can also pick up our book, the pursuit of growth on the website. Follow us on our social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, kind of keep up with what we're up to. But man, once again, Rob, this was a freaking cool conversation. I enjoyed this yeah, a lot of fun. more than I thought, and I knew it was <laughs> going to be good. But uh, Sammy, any last thoughts? No, I just want to say, again, thank you so much. I, I think the audience is going to get a, a ton of value out of this. I think there's a lot of life lessons inside of all the comments that you, that you mentioned there. And 
honestly, I'd love to be able to number one, have you back on the show once you kind of can elaborate more on, on what you have going on. But then number two, I'd love to go share a, a bourbon with you somewhere. So let's, let's make that happen. Yeah. Let's, let's do both of those. Sounds good. Awesome. Make it happen. Well guys, well, thank you again, all. Let the pursuit of growth. Peace.